Good morning, everyone. I want to invite our team to come up and find a seat. Uh, they said there's no video. I was waiting for the mission spotlight, but I guess we are the mission spotlight this morning. And we're so happy to see you. And look at this beautiful group of young adults. Uh, they're trying to figure out whether they have to sit boy, girl, girl, or whether they can just sit wherever they come up. This is the big decision this morning. But uh, just grab a seat wherever, wherever you can find one. And... Uh, we're going to study together. Now, what I need to ask you is, do you all have a copy of this blue sheet? Can you raise your hand if you don't have a copy and you need one? Okay, we've got uh, someone coming right behind you. So just keep your hand raised, please. Want to make sure everyone has a copy of this single page out. You can download this from hopesabbathschool.tv from our website. And uh, in fact, we have tens of thousands of teachers around the world that use this single sheet outline. Uh, you can get it from our website. And we want you to use it as we study together today. Is that okay? So again, just wave your hand. If you didn't get one when you were coming in, we have enough for everybody. And again, welcome to Sabbath School. And I just want to welcome Natalia and Erwin and Lauren and Sharice and Joseph, and Rachel, and Byron, and Sonia, and Gilbert, and Brenda, and Darlene, and Chris. I know Chris, and Evelyn, it just doesn't seem right to have you in the back row there. Can you come over here, and I'll be very careful not to fall down. I think just come around here. We don't want to have you in the back row, and I'll stand here so that I'm, I know Pastor Mark wants to make sure that I don't fall down. But we're just going to, I don't want you sitting in the back. Would you welcome these young people to our Sabbath school today? One of the things I've learned in work is to be flexible. If you can't stand on the top step, you stand on the next step down. But we wanted to make sure Evelyn had a seat. I want to pray with you because this is my favorite chapter in the book of Romans. And I, as I was reviewing it with our group, and I'm so amazed to see this group here because I know they have stories too. Uh, I was thinking, thank you, God, that we can study this topic, no condemnation. And I just lost my voice there for a moment. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I just want to thank you for the privilege that we have. Your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And I just pray that you would bless each of our team members and each one of us as part of this in-depth, interactive study of your word. May your will be done in our hearts today as we study. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And I'll let our AV team, if they tell me that the mic's going in and out, want to just hand me a hand mic, I will just pick it up and keep going, okay? Take your Bibles. If you didn't bring one, there may be, is there one right in front of you? If you didn't bring one, we're going to the Gospel of Romans. It was a short uh, letter that was written by the Apostle Paul to Christians in Rome. And we're starting in Romans chapter 8. And I'm going to ask Byron if you'd start our study today by reading one of the most amazing verses in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 8. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And then my Bible includes, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. That's probably omitted in some manuscripts, right? But let's go with the first part of it. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So there are two questions I have to ask the team. And if you want to answer two, you can just call out. That sounds pretty important because I don't know about you, but when you stand before the judge of all the universe... It would be wonderful to know that the result is no condemnation. Amen. So, what condemnation is it talking about? Anybody want to tell me? What does it mean, no condemnation? Yes, Brenda. The condemnation, uh, for me, it means to be enslaved, uh, to be enslaved to sin. And okay. Sets us free from that. All right, Brenda starts by saying part of the condemnation is that you... And I won't use any of their names because we, we want to be part of the redeemed. Okay? But, but to the lost person, you know, 
you remained a slave to sin. But it's, it's more than that. No, not only is no condemnation that I've been freed from sin, but what? What else? What does it mean, no condemnation? Anybody? Yes? What I picture in my mind when you say there's no condemnation, I see it as we have an advocate in Jesus Christ. He Amen. is our friend yes. and he is our lawyer. And the wages of sin, according to Romans, is... And how many of us have sinned, according to Romans? We didn't even need Romans to tell us that, did we? We know we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. How can we have no condemnation when we stand before a holy God? Well, that's where the second part of the verse of Byron read, where it said, there's no condemnation to those who are... So someone on the team, maybe Lauren, what does it mean to be in Christ Jesus? Because I want to stand before the judge of the ages, who, by the way, also is the same one in, who gives me no condemnation, and I want him to say, no condemnation, right? So what does it mean to be in Christ Jesus, Lauren? Well, I think the beauty of it is that it's a choice to accept salvation that God has given us. It's, it's the offer, and it's receiving that gift. That sounds awfully simple. Amen. Amen. Did it ever dawn on you that God is not trying to keep people out of heaven? If God was trying to keep people out of heaven, the Son of God could have just stayed with the angels adoring Him for out eternity, and we would all be damned. What He's trying to do is save us for eternity. And Lauren has given us a simple and yet powerful answer. It's, it's a choice that we make. Now, Maybe in your mind you're saying, why in the world wouldn't everyone make that choice then? What's the answer? Why in the world wouldn't everyone make that choice to say, I accept Christ, Chris, no condemnation because of what Jesus has done for me. Why wouldn't everyone make that choice? You need a microphone. Can you pass that over? You know, I think... Uh most of us want to make that choice, but we, we struggle and, and fight with our, our flesh, our carnal nature that, that we battle against you know, every day. So it's a, it's a, a choice that we have to make uh, you know, moment by moment to look at Christ and see His, His love and His beauty and, and desire to be like Him so that we can be in Him. Now, Chris is a pa youth pastor at a church here in town. Amen. Could be living for the devil, but he's living for Jesus, <laughs> right? And, and part of the answer which he's given us is that I struggle, my human nature. But there may be another reason why a person doesn't make the choice to let Jesus be their savior, and it could be... It could be... They don't Evelyn. want to. They simply don't want to. Okay, that's a second option. Byron says they know about it, and they say, I'm on the highway to hell, and I don't care. Is that possible? It is possible. I think there's another reason, though, why someone might not say, oh, well, I'm going to trust Jesus. What do you think, Evelyn? Why do we do Hope Sabbath School? Why do we have Hope Channel broadcasting all around the world in 57 languages? Why do we do that? Is it just to keep us busy until Jesus comes? Is it possible that some people, they don't know? They're like, you're kidding. And you've known that for how many years and you haven't told me? That I could stand before the judge of all the ages and have him say, no condemnation, brother. No condemnation. Because you are in Christ Jesus. Is that amazing? You know, uh, I, I, I met Elder C.D. Brooks' sister this morning. Where are you, sister? Yes, honored to meet you. Elder Brooks was a mentor of mine. You know, and he, he spoke about the grace of God. He said, when we get to heaven, we'll have three surprises. Do you know what they are? The first one is that we made it by the grace of God. Why? Because we made, we made a choice to say, Jesus, would you save me? The second big surprise, did you ever hear Elder Brooks share this? The second big surprise 
is that there are some people there that we were sure were not going to be there. And do you know why they're there? Like a dying thief who said, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. So there's some we were sure were not going to be there, and they will be there by the grace of God. Amen? Amen. But there's a third surprise Elder Brooks told me. This is a sad one. You know what it is? There are some people who were such good hypocrites. They look so good. Jesus spoke of whitewashed tombs or sepulchers, but they're full of dead men's bones. They were such good hypocrites that we were just sure they were going to be there, but they're not there. Why? They didn't make a choice to be in Christ. They were religious. They were critical of others who weren't as religious as they were. But they didn't stand in Christ. So I think if we stop with that first verse, <laughs> whew, could, could we go home and say, I learned something important today in church? Amen. And I want to challenge you. I'm going to make a call later. But I want to challenge you. If there's someone here and you've never said, Jesus, will you save me? What do you think about doing that today? Amen. So here's the next important question. We're on two, uh, 1B. And we're having so much fun, but we've got to keep moving. How do I get to be in Christ then? It's a choice. So in order to make that choice, Gilbert, in order to make that choice, you remember in Romans it says, how will they hear? In order to make that choice, what, what needs to happen? I think we all have a, an obligation to, to go and spread out the good news, doing our small part that you know, we are called to do, whichever sphere of life we are in, we have to take and contribute and make a part. And I also wanted to mention that you know, knowing Christ and having no condemnation is practical. It means it's being set free from the burden of sin that we all have. You know, we make mistakes, but the beauty of being a Christian is that there is no condemnation. You are forgiven. Your conscience can be free. You can walk up tall. Often a time, you know, we walk with our head bowed because of the mistakes that we have made, that we are making, or the weaknesses that we have. But it says there's no condemnation. So this is good news that, you know, you can actually stand up and you are forgiven, you are redeemed, you have another chance. They say God is not a God of second chance. He's a God of chance every second. So we ought to spread that good news. Mm. So Gilbert's telling us that in order for a person to make that choice, they, they need to know. Yeah. And someone has to tell them. Uh, Erwin, microphone. Yeah, we believe that choices must be made. Um, but prior to that, there must be some kind of uh, information. Yes. Not only information, but correct or right information before a person could, could make any choice. And the Bible tells us in John 6.45 that God is teaching every person in the whole world. So unless, and when somebody learns from the teaching of God, we don't know how, we don't know when God is teaching every person in the world, but he does, he's teaching. And the good thing is, in the book of Acts chapter 2, verses 17 to 19, it tells us in there that uh, the Holy Spirit is what? Will be sent to every flesh, to every person. So we understand in Romans 7 that anyone or anybody cannot and could not and wouldn't make a choice for God because they are sinful. But unless a person is being educated or taught by God, that's the best time a person could choose salvation or God. All right. I could get distracted here and say, how does that happen? Uh, I guess God could write it in the sky or he could send an angel. But what's the most common way that he presents that information? Preaching. 
through people, right? Through people, like Gilbert said, whether you're working in IT or you're a pastor or you're in grad school or wherever you are, that is through people that that is shared. Evelyn. Also uh, through us as members of a church, through us because people are observing us how we behave. Also through our friends, the, we give them a good example. How the way we, we treat them, they will see, oh, look, Evelyn is different. She's not like my other friends. Yes, because I have Jesus Christ in my heart. We're going to move on to verse 2, and I'm going to ask, uh, let's see, Darlene, do you have your Bible? Could you read verse 2 of Romans 8, follow along with us, because there's a freedom that comes to us. You know, Jesus said, if the Son, can you help me with this? If the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. Free indeed. What is the freedom that comes? Let's listen as Darlene reads verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus had set me free from the law of sin and death. Now some people might say, I've trusted Jesus, so I'm saved by grace, and it doesn't matter what I do. But we're not set free from the law of God. That doesn't mean we keep the law to be saved. It means, I don't say, I, I'm saved by grace, so I'm going to commit adultery, and I'm going to steal from you, and I may even kill you if I'm upset. That's absurd, isn't it? I'm still going to live in harmony with the Word of God. What is it that I'm set free from through Christ? Not only condemnation, but what else? You, you kind of talked about it a little bit when you talked about the struggle we go through. Joseph? I think that, well, it says right here the law of sin and death because, because in our old self, before we accepted Christ, we lived, we lived according to sin. But when Christ set us free, we no longer live for ourselves or, it's, or we're no longer enslaved to that sin. We now live for Christ. And when you start living in Christ, it's truly when you start seeing yourself being changed. So you now I have a question for you if that's true. So we're free from that old life. Uh, is that a one-time, is that a one-time, what, what, what did Paul mean when he said, I'm crucified with Christ, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Another place he says, I die daily. What, what does that mean? I, if I'm set free by Jesus, is it possible to get pulled back into that slavery again, or, or is it all done? What's the answer? Anybody want to help, either out here or... Is it possible, Brenda? Absolutely possible. Um, the enemy comes like a roaring lion to destroy, and he is working overtime. So is God and his angels. So we have to keep in mind that we are protected with Christ, but we have to stay in his shield and not go back uh, when that temptation comes and tries to tempt us, and we have to stay firm in his word and living the word. So that choice that Lauren talked about, uh, is that a daily is that a daily choice? Yes. A moment by moment choice. Isn't there a text somewhere that says, "Let the one one who thinks he stands take heed." You're saying I don't want you to fall up the step either, so I'm concentrating, right? <laughs> uh, that doesn't mean we live in fear. It means that we live with our eyes focused on Jesus. I said day by day, and, and I think Lawrence said moment by moment. <laughs> that's not fear. That's a, that's a commitment, right? To keep my eyes focused on Jesus. Let's go on to section two, what Christ accomplished for us. Now, we know the Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. How? Through Jesus Christ our Lord. But let's look at Romans 8, verses 3 and 4. Natalia, if you have that, I see you're looking on your iPad there. We're hoping the battery doesn't fail. No, I charged it. Uh, you charged it. You're ready. Okay, verses 3 and 4 of Romans 8. Romans 8, 3 and 4. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the like likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering and so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the spirit now that's an amazing thing you just read 
it's wonderful that I can stand before the judge of all ages and he'll say, no condemnation. Why? Because I am, I'm in Christ. But this text goes on to tell us that something is not only happening for me, follow me now, but something is also happening in me. Well, and also, something is going to happen through me, right? You talked about, but let's talk about what's happening in me. Because the Bible does say, the same author, if any person is in Christ, there's that saying again, she or he is a new creation. Someone ought to say hallelujah. That's my favorite Hebrew word. Hallelujah. A new creation, the old is, and all things have become new. So, wow, we're not saved by keeping the law, but is it possible that redeemed people, that the, that the righteous deeds of the law will be fulfilled in us? Is that possible? If it isn't possible, then Paul got mixed up here because he said the righteous deeds of the law will be fulfilled in us. So, how does that happen? By faith. By the power of the Holy Spirit, right? And when we see that happening, it may even surprise us. Yes? So, wow. Before I gave my heart to Jesus, I know what I would have done when that person cut in front of me there in the, on that road, you know? And instead of that, I thought, Lord, bless that person. I don't know why they're so stressed today and making hand gestures at me. <laughs> bless them, Lord. Right? The righteous deeds of the law. Why is it important, even when I'm seeing Christ in me, the hope of glory, to remember that it's not about what I do that recommends me to God, but what Christ has done. Why is that important? Always remembering that. Byron, why is that important? Because we need to remember that we're not the ones that save ourselves. We're not the ones that, that follow the law in such a way that it'll get us into heaven because the law cannot save us. So in the same way that we aren't condemned by the things that we do because there's no condemnation, we also have to remember that we are not saved by the things that we do. And what happens, uh, anybody, if I start looking at myself and saying, well, I'm doing really well. Or, do you remember Peter when he was walking on the water? Hey, good. Look how well I'm doing. What happened? Yes, Rachel. You will fall. And the reason why I say this is because I've done it before and I've noticed that whenever I take my eyes off Christ, that's when it is when I start doing the things that I'm like, oh, I, I thought I stopped doing this. It's because I stopped doing my devotions. I stopped looking to Christ. And the scripture in the Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher on, say of my faith. If we're not looking to him, he, he start, but he's, how can he continue to finish a good work in us if we're not looking unto him? So why does Rachel have the courage in front of a group of people and a group of young adult peers to say, when I take my eyes off Jesus, I fall. Why does she have the courage to tell me that? Because it's true? <laughs> Why does she have the courage to tell us that? Why isn't she putting up a mask and saying, everything's fine? Yes, I'm here in church. Paid my time. Why does she have the courage to share that with us? Because she knows what? I think there's two things she knows for sure. One is that we're all in the same boat. And if you're pretending like you never stumble, in fact, doesn't the Bible say somewhere, uh, if we say we have no sin, very strong. It's right before the verse that says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. Right before that, it says, you say, I'm fine. There's probably another reason though why she can say that with confidence because she knows that her assurance is not based on how well she's doing at this moment. Her assurance is based on being in Christ. <laughs> Are you, if you stumble when that person cuts in front of you over there on whatever that avenue is, 
that you drove on? Do you, do you fall out of grace? I mean, if you die right after you got angry, are you a lost person? Is that how it works? Is that how it works? Is it like a balance and you've got too much? It, that's not how it works. Now, we ought not to be careless. When I find myself acting that way, I need to make sure I keep my... Right? Jesus, would you be saying that to this motorist? No. Keep my eyes on Jesus. That the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us. Isn't that amazing? I think we'd be. Let's look at another verse. Keep going here. Sonia, you have your Bible there. If you could read for us. We're following along if you're just joining us, by the way. Did you come in and get the blue sheet? Does everybody have the blue sheet? Anybody need it? Did you come in and didn't get it? Okay. We've got a hand raised in the back. Thanks for making sure. You can download this from our Hope Sabbath School website. But we brought some for you today. Thank you to our pastoral team for making those available. We're looking at verses 5 and 6, Sonia, as we're continuing our study about no condemnation. Living according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. How many of you would like life and peace? You know, I, I met a lady in Namibia. Anybody know where Namibia is? Well, she, she was given to the care of a couple as a baby. She was a colic baby, and they practiced black magic on her, and she came under the forces of, of, evil, of demons. And she grew up with a tremendous awareness of demons, and uh, she had great power. She was in medical school when she finally, Jesus set her free. She had great power over people because of these demons. But she said to me, she said, there is one thing. Satan can give you power. He can give you popularity. He can give you money. This is her testimony. Would you like to guess? She said, there is one thing that Satan cannot give you. Peace. She said, it's like having lions on a leash. And you have to keep feeding them. And if you don't, they'll turn around and bite you. No peace. You can't sleep. You can't relax for a moment. But this says life and peace. So here's my question for a team member. It says those who live according to the Spirit. So, Sharice, what does that mean, you think? To live according to the Spirit. We're not talking about earning our salvation, right? We've already said that. That comes by being in Christ, right? So what does it mean now to live according to the Spirit? Um, I believe that God gave us the Spirit um, every day. When we walk through life, He's talking to us through the Spirit. So I feel like He's talking to us. Therefore, I feel like we need to listen. And a lot of times it's easier or we don't want to listen to the Holy Spirit because we're like, oh, we don't want to hear that. But it's for our own good and our own peace. And a lot of times we forget that. So you, you are making a radical claim. No, no, Rachel. Sharice. Sharice, right? She turned for a moment, hit her name tag. You are making a radical claim that the Holy Spirit can actually communicate with followers of Jesus. Is that right? And how does that happen? Joseph? Uh, I think if you go back and read John, he, he says in there, I will give you, I will give you a helper and he will never leave you or forsake you. He, yeah. he will not leave you as orphans. So, Would you like to read that for us in John 14? I think that's yeah. where you're referring to. Correct. John 14 verses 15 through 17. And actually verse 18 is also powerful. John 14, if you're following along, two place, we're coming back to Romans 8 in just a moment. Um, it says in verse, in verse 16 where it starts off, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. That he, and the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you, and he will be in you. Wow. He will dwell with you and be in you. Be in you. So you're telling me that one of the ways that Sharif, hears the Holy Spirit guiding her so she can live by the Spirit is the Holy Spirit is actually 
dwelling in her as a follower of Jesus and can speak to her mind, to her conscience, what? Voices? Conviction? What? Help me someone. How does that come through when you know the Holy Spirit speaking to you? Well, it's like I've heard people say, like you mentioned demons, just as well as demons exist, so does God's Holy Spirit exist within us. So when you are hearing within your mind, do that, don't do that. That is the Holy Spirit giving you discernment of what you should do, what you should not do, why you should not go back and turn to your past and why you should go forward. And praise God for that. Okay, is there another way that the Holy Spirit can speak to us, Natalia, so that we can live by the Spirit? got a microphone? Yep. No? Okay, we'll share that one then. Did it get turned off? Okay, sorry. So I think another way um, the Spirit talks to us is even reading through the Bible. Um, sometimes you might not be, you know, you, like yesterday, for example, I was studying for today, and I, to be honest, I was nervous. Um, and all of a sudden, I just flipping through a few things, and I got a verse that said, just stay calm. I mean, that to me was exactly what I needed to hear. Um, so even... <laughs> Your word is a lamp to my feet and a... So you're telling me, Natalia, that you're preparing for today, feeling a little nervous, but as you read the Bible, the Holy Spirit spoke to you through the word. I believe so, yes. Okay. Anybody else can testify that that's happened to you? Amen. Yes? Okay. Uh, the night of my conversion, working at a British bank in the UK where I grew up, feeling like my prayers had bounced off of the ceiling, that I was actually a lost person. I opened my Bible to a 3,000-year-old scripture song. And it said, I waited patiently for the Lord. And He inclined to me. And He heard my cry. And He lifted me up out of the pit, some of you have been in the pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet on a new path, and gave me a new song to sing, the praises to our God. Many will hear and will trust in the Lord. I didn't know I'd be a preacher when that happened. But something happened, as Natalia testified, that that 3,000-year-old word became the living word of God to me. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. So in order to be living by the Spirit, we have to listen to the Spirit. Do we need to consciously invite the Holy Spirit to fill us each day? Or would you say that's automatic? Because, what do you think? What, anybody? Yes, uh, Darlene. Yes. yes. Um, it is a daily struggle. I mean, waking up each day, you have to literally fall on your knees and say, Lord, use me today. Remove anything in me that's a stumbling block. And I know that that can be hard because sometimes we may get tired and we don't want to get up or the devil is always there to say, sleep some more. But you just have to fight it and say, Lord, like, I need you today. Help me. Amen. 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 You know, when I was a young pastor, actually, it's when I first met uh, Elder Brooks, uh, I met another man of God named Emilio Connectly. Now, most of you are way too young to even know that name, but you can Google the name. You might find some things about this great man of God, Emilio Connectly. But he said, the first thing, first thing, Darlene, you write on. He said, as soon as I open my eyes, I roll out of bed, open my eyes, I roll down, kneel down. I say, Lord, I give my heart to you today. Save, save me from myself. I'm a dangerous man. <laughs> were it not for grace I can tell you where I'd be wandering down some pointless road to nowhere some of you know the song right with my salvation up to me I know how that would go now the the struggles or trials I would face forever. 
but losing the race, were it not for grace. So that daily commitment. Now, it's something really amazing. And we keep reading. We've got about uh, 14 minutes left. So I'm going to go to verses 15 through 17 because um, it's beautiful here in Romans chapter 8 how the Holy Spirit wants to help us. And uh, Lauren, would you read that for us? We've got a microphone for you. Oh, you've got two microphones for you, okay? Uh, verses 15 through 17. I think, I may be wrong, but I didn't really grow up being very aware of the awesome enabling presence of the Holy Spirit. I think if we realize how powerful the Holy Spirit wants to be in us and, and through us, I, I think we'd make that daily. Please, film me. Please, film me to overflowing. So let's, let's take a look uh, at verses 15 through 17. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If then, indeed, sorry, go ahead. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. And then verse 16, uh, verse 26, excuse me, because we're talking about how the Holy Spirit will help us. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Wow. So the Holy Spirit gives us uh, the freedom to be able to cry out, Abba. Abba. Now someone told me that, that Abba, Aramaic, Abba is like a term of endearment. Now, I, I feel a little, I feel a little awkward saying Holy Daddy. Because that, that, he dwells between the cherubim, right? But, but, but to call him my father, knowing that there's an intimate relationship, does that matter? Right? What, what does it mean to you? How does it impact you? The God of the universe, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, wants an intimate relationship with you. That you can speak to Him in an intimate way. Anybody? What's that do for you, Gilbert? I think it gives um, meaning and purpose to our life. You know that you are created for a purpose. You have a mission that you live for. Yeah. So. Having God being central in our lives gives our lives meaning and purpose. And that's what the world out there is looking for. You know, what is my purpose? What, why am I here? Right. But bringing God and Him being our Father, being central in our lives gives meaning and purpose. So I want to give someone an opportunity to testify, either from our group or someone here. When, when did you come to the place, or maybe we're still on our way, but when did you come to the place when you realized that God wanted a, a personal relationship with you. Anybody? Yes, Erwin. Uh, Hold the mic close. Yeah, first of all, yeah, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, uh, thank you. We have two mics. <laughs> what happens is they love to push the little red button and then it goes off. I'm just wondering if experiencing the Holy Spirit goes with the age or the way we, you know. I'm turning 51 this coming December and I'm proud of it. I'm just kidding. You're still alive. Yeah, and when I was in my uh, 30s, uh, I lived this way, but when I turned 40s and 45 and up, I told my wife that I guess the best thing to, to experience now is to listen first from the Holy Spirit. So since then, two years ago, up to this time, every time we wake up in the morning, before getting up from the bed, we experience talking first to the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean you have to kneel on the floor. Even lying down, I meditate and talk to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, please help us know what to do today, which should be my priority, and what is the best thing uh, uh, 
that I do today. So please, I need guidance. So okay, I'm going to hold you right there because uh, he's basically uh, given his testimony that as he got older, he got closer. But some people, if they had that attitude, if uh, a young person like Rachel said, I'll wait till I get older, she may not even live to 51, right? So I'm glad that, that Irwin experienced that, but that could be kind of dangerous, right? Chris, help me with that. You work with young people, young adults. You tell them, you know, just when you're about 50, I'm, this not to, I praise God for what he's done for Irwin, right? Uh, but doesn't it say somewhere today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart, you know? So, yeah, intimate relationship. Have you met young people who experience an intimate relationship with God? Yeah, I, I've met um, uh, quite a few young people who are uh, responding to the Holy Spirit. And, and that's one reason why I'm excited about the soon coming of Jesus, because I know it's soon. I know it's, uh, it's close, because I can see the Spirit moving uh, in a mighty way in young people today. And I remember when I was, when I was young, right before my father uh, passed away, or, or he died, and he, he wrote me a letter. I was 11 years old, and he wrote me a letter. And, and I didn't know my father knew, knew Christ. Um, but he wrote me a letter telling me that I was a prince of a king that I did not yet know. Mm, come and on, someone say amen. amen. You, you maybe need to write that letter to one of your grandchildren or your children. Tell them that, that they're the prince of a king that they may not yet know. Wow. And when, when did that sink in for you? You were only 11. Yeah, at, at 11, I, I, I grew up in a, in a Roman Catholic um, home. And my father had converted to, to being a, a Christian right before he, he passed. And he, he, after writing that letter, um, I made a promise that I would seek out this king. Because that's, this, this, when, when it says, Abba, Father. I'm glad I came to church today, are you? We're hearing a young adult who's now a pastor, who as a young person made a promise he would seek out that king. And uh, at that moment, I remember, it, like it was yesterday, that I wanted to see my earthly father uh, again in heaven because he had made that, yes. uh, he, had, he had wrote me that letter, but the, the desire to meet my heavenly father was so strong. I wanted to see them both together and hug them all three. So I know that that's what I try to share with my, the young people that I, that I reach and that I, and I talk to that experience so that they can have that experience of their father in heaven because a lot of us are fatherless uh, on this earth uh, we, we feel alone and, and there's many people who don't understand what what the father really wants us like that relationship so it, it's a it's a real heart changing experience and, and i i praise god for him giving me that experience Amen. the spirit of god's moving at the group right now we've got a lot of people wanting to share but i'm going to turn to evelyn here uh, if you want to respond to how you when you became aware that God wanted an intimate relationship with you? Yeah. Uh, this was, this happened probably like a couple months ago. Just a couple months ago. Yeah, no, but I always... It's good, just don't push the button. No, I always knew that God always wanted me to have a relationship with him. But this happened... Uh, couple months ago that I was at uh, my church and my pastor was preaching that his father, he never met his father. And the same thing to me, I never met my father. So, so I came out with that decision and God told me, you know, I'm your father. And I, and I told him like, okay, if you're my father, Lord, please help me not to defeat you or to defraud you. Like, because you need to teach me how to live in this life because you didn't give me a father here to teach me, to guide me, to how to behave and all that stuff. And there's now like I come to him and I said, Father, you're my father, so you're going to give me my food. You're going to give me guidance. You're going to give me what I need. Because you didn't give me who, who can take care of me. You're going to take care of me. So that's what God did to me. And every morning I, I'm, I wake up with this joy that I have a heavenly father that looks up after me, which is amazing. I mean, it's. It's, it's great. How, I love have to have the power. How do you think our Heavenly Father felt? How do you think Jesus, Son of God, Holy Spirit felt, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, when Evelyn said, God, you got to take care of me? How do you think God felt? 
not another one. Do you know angels sing? Angels sing. God, you've got to take care of me. I mean, it's not a demand. It's a cry of the heart, isn't it? And, and one last verse. And let's see, who hasn't read yet for us? Who hasn't read a text yet? Has everybody read so far? All right, Rachel. Verse 28. I love this verse, but you know, many of us read Romans 8, 28 without reading the whole chapter. And um, I don't think we really understand it without reading the whole chapter, but we've been studying Romans 8 today. What a great chapter starts out by telling us that there is what? No, no condemnation. Because we are in Christ Jesus. We can walk and live by the Spirit. The Spirit gives us freedom to ha have an intimate relationship with our Abba Father. It's going to help us know how to pray. But, but Rachel, this is amazing. Verse 28 of Romans 8. What does it tell us? It says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. And what shall we say to these things? Verse 31. If God is for us, who shall be against us? Evelyn? Right? God is with me. <laughs> and He will take care of me. And I'm just holding my hand with him, to Him. But let's go back to verse 28. We know... Some people misunderstand this text, right? It doesn't say all things are good, right? It doesn't say only good happens to the followers of Jesus, right? What does it say? That God can work good even out of a bad situation. So a testimony from someone. We just got one minute, 50 seconds. Don't rush. Byron, a time when you saw God work good out of a bad situation for you. Good out of a bad situation. I was a missionary, and I had a, one of my, I was a youth leader, and I had one of my youth, and I c had a misunderstanding to the point where he threatened to, to kill me. And That's a serious misunderstanding, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> that is a serious misunderstanding. And I was wrestling with God every night, and I kept praying to God, but here's the thing, that I knew that if I responded in kind or anywhere close to that, that all the time that I'd spent with him, all the time that I've talked to him about Jesus, would fall away. So I kept falling on my knees and asking God to hold on and to help me hold on and continue to reflect his character. And then eventually one day he came and he hugged me and he apologized with tears in his eyes. Which meant that all the other stuff that I told him was confirmed and made more sense to him. It was deepened in his heart because I was able to just swallow my pride and hold on. That is living by the Spirit. Amen? That is living by the Spirit, not to earn His favor, but because we are children of God, we've chosen to stand in Christ and live by His Spirit. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, what a great, what a great revelation here in Romans chapter 8. And I thank you for these young adults who, who said, Jesus, I want to follow you to stand in Christ. And Lord, I pray for each of us today that we would say again, Jesus, I stand in you. New creation, fill me with your spirit. May I live to honor you today. Thank you that you can turn good even out of bad, and we'll give you all of the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us for Hope Sabbath School today. Thank you. Let's thank the team.